This is chicken, and chicken is a crested gecko. Maybe the best pet gecko you could possibly keep, but how do you take care of them? Today, we're gonna go over everything you need to know about taking care of your new crested gecko. My name's Adam, this is Chicken. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. I love crested geckos. I think what it really comes down to is, for most people, crested gecko or leopard gecko. We've done videos about that, but a lot of people will choose a crested gecko because, well, they're just better in a lot of ways, and people prefer them because of these things. So let's just go through it. We'll talk about size, enclosures, behavior, all of that, and how you should take care of them. Starting off, of course, with size. That's the important part. And this is about how big they're going to get. They might get up to about 10 inches, really big ones, from nose to tail. But that tail is going to be probably four or five inches of their length. So without the tail, they're going to be kind of a shorter animal. Not one of the bigger lizards that you could keep for sure. About a medium-sized gecko, I would say. And they're from New Caledonia, by the way, which is this really cool island kind of in the middle of nowhere, kind of close to Australia. And you're going to find really interesting species like Jehua geckos, gargoyle geckos, and a whole bunch of other ones as well. Fun fact, crested geckos were thought to be extinct until 1994. In 1994, there, were, there was researchers looking on New Caledonia for geckos and doing surveys, and then one of these guys fell into one of their tents. And they thought, what the heck is this? I thought they were extinct. And then now, not even 30 years later, on every expo table, there's crested geckos that are almost being given away because, well, we'll get to price in a second. So this is how big the animal is going to get. So the next logical question is how big is the enclosure going to be? Well, an enclosure is going to be a lot bigger than the animal, of course. And you wanna make sure that you give enough room to have a thermal gradient, which we're gonna to get to next. So what I recommend is a front opening enclosure that's taller than it is long because this is an animal that is arboreal or semi-arboreal. So they're gonna spend most of their time up in the perches and the trees on the glass because they can climb the glass. And that's something that's really cool too is if you give them a glass enclosure, they're gonna be able to use that surface. So 18 inches by 18 inches by 24 inches tall is the recommendation that I give for one gecko. You could even keep two in there if you wanted. And if you wanted to give them a bigger enclosure, there's nothing wrong with that at all. They're not gonna to get too stressed out as long as you give them a lot of plants and branches and hides and things like that so they feel secure. What I do is I have a naturalistic enclosure. I've got two geckos in this enclosure. I actually have a third one because it's a breeding project right now, but usually it's only two that live in here. And it's just a front opening enclosure. They come pretty darn cheap. And then of course, if you wanted to not use real plants, just use logs, sticks, artificials, just give them a lot of places so they can go and feel secure. Besides that, for a substrate, you can use paper towel if you want. I mean, a naturalistic substrate is better for me because I use plants. So what I use is a mix of topsoil, coconut core, and sand. I just mix that stuff up. I put moss on the top to add humidity. And then I have a ledge in there for them to feed on. So it's just really simple setup. It looks pretty, but it really wasn't that much work or that expensive to make. Of course, if you want to add a misting system, I recommend it. If it's your only gecko, you can just spray them a couple times a day. Heat, humidity, and lighting is the next category. And this is really simple and I think why crested geckos make some of the best pets ever. Just because simply, oh, they jump by the way, which is what he's trying to do. He's gonna jump on my shirt, I bet. Or my face, either way. Either way, these guys, the heat, humidity, and lighting is really simple. And basically what you want is you want a gradient from top to bottom because it's gonna be a taller enclosure. Normally, if you had like a bearded dragon or a leopard gecko, you'd want left to right or right to left, hot side, cool side. What you do here is top is gonna to be warmer because you're gonna have some sort of heat source like a halogen light or maybe a ceramic heat emitter, something like that, so that the branches at the top, not too close to the light of course, are gonna be around 80, just a little bit below 80. I recommend 78-ish. And again, this is a care guide. They come from the wild. There is no you know, regulation or thermostat of, on the sun where they're from. So as long as you give them enough spaces, if it's say 82 at the top, just they'll go a little bit lower and it's only that for a couple hours a day, you're totally fine. If it only gets to 76, well, I recommend you bump it up, but there is gonna be fluctuation, so don't worry. You're not a bad gecko parent if it's not perfect. And then at the bottom, you want it around 72 degrees, just low 70s. I mean, realistically, as long as there's a big enough space for them to be between 72 and 78, 
you're good to go. And keep in mind, these geckos do not do well over 80 degrees. So make sure that if your enclosure is getting over 80 and a part of it, it's only for part of the day and it's not the entire enclosure. Now, as far as humidity goes, I recommend that you do something around 60%. It doesn't have to be exactly 60, but somewhere around 60%, you can go as high as 80, as low as 50, but you wanna balance it out. And of course, you're going to have it fluctuate through the course of the day. So you're not gonna have a constant 60 from you know 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock. It's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have fluctuation. You want it to dry out a bit and then mist it again. So what I do is I have a misting system that mists twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, and naturally the humidity will build at night because not only did you just mist it, but also, where are you going, chicken? But also because naturally when the lights go out, the lights are gonna suck humidity. So when there's no lights, there's nothing to suck the humidity out. Therefore, it's gonna be more humid. This is how it works in nature too, by the way. And as far as lighting, I mean, they do definitely need a, I would say 12 hour, 12 hour uh, cycle of light and dark. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you wanna do, you know, 14, 10, it doesn't, it's fine, it's fine. As long as they have a photo period that's naturalistic, that's totally fine. Mine changes throughout the year just because the light comes in this room through that back window and then I light cycle some other animals in here for breeding. So usually sun up to sundown is what I do with mine. And I do recommend UVB, a maybe a 2.0, maybe 5.0 if you're, you give lots and lots of height, but they don't really need a high strength UVB. In fact, they're very rarely going to be out during the day anyway, but I still do recommend it a lot of people don't use it. I can only give a recommendation. I can't tell you what to do. So I would recommend UVB. And always use a linear bulb, by the way. A linear bulb works great. The company doesn't really matter if you're gonna use a Zoomed or Arcadia or whatever. I'm not sponsored by any of them. They're all great. And you're gonna use a 5.0 bulb. They're not the cheapest things in the world and you do have to replace them about every six months or so. I mean, look at the manufacturer and of course test it if you can. But either way, let's just move on to the next part. And that is diet. So the diet is really simple because these guys eat a powdered diet most of the time. I recommend that you also give live insects, but we'll get to that in a sec. The powder diet you're gonna use, it doesn't matter the brand. You can use Rapashi, Pangea, Clark's. There's a whole bunch of different ones. And of course, you're gonna use different flavors and the picky part about Cresta Geckos, maybe the most difficult part, is sometimes they're picky and sometimes they're only gonna eat certain flavors. For example, chicken here doesn't like the grub, which has insect uh, protein inside of it. She likes the mango. She doesn't really like the peach. So they're kind of picky, right? But you, you'll figure it out. You just mix it up with water. It's super simple. The directions are on the back. You pour it into a cup and then you put it up off the floor is what I recommend on a, either a magnet or a suction cup holder, four cups. And I do recommend live insects once a week. So you dust them with calcium and, and vitamins. Uh, do your research on this because it's, this is like the most debated part of keeping geckos basically is how to supplement them correctly. Every other week they get calcium with D3, the week they don't, just calcium, and they get a multivitamin every single time. But rest assured, Rapashi, Pangea, Clarks, all those companies have those uh, nutrients and minerals inside of the paste that you're gonna give them too. Now, as far as behavior goes, this is another thing that people really like. Now, of course, they're kind of shy sometimes, like you can see chicken is just, oh, what's up buddy, all right. Prove me wrong. So they're crepuscular, which means they're out during the dawn and dusk. I mean, sometimes they're out during the day, sometimes they're out during the night, but either way, you're not gonna see them too often during the day. In my experience, I've been keeping Cresta geckos for 13 years. So long ago that there was no Rapashi back in the day, or maybe there was, but it wasn't available, and we were told to feed them baby food. <laughs> Don't do that. There's no reason to do that. It's actually more expensive than feeding Rapashi anyway. I digress. So those tails I was talking about, the cute little tails that they have, they will drop sometimes on a whim. Some of these guys are scaredy cats and just by looking at them or like thunder in the wild, something like that, they'll literally drop their tail because they're scared. Sometimes you can yank on the tail. Don't ever do this. I'm just painting a picture here. Sometimes you can be a little bit rougher or the male can be rougher with the female when they breed, that type of thing, and they'll retain the tail. So I've got one female with the tail and chicken is a female too, has a tail, the male has a tail as well. So just keep in mind, the tail can fall off, it never grows back, but they can live a full and healthy life without that tail. In terms of handling, they're very inapt to bite. They're probably not gonna bite you. And if they do, it usually feels like sandpaper. It's not that big of a deal. I've only been bitten by a Cresta Gecko once and it was chicken actually. And she wedged herself in a little spot in her old enclosure when she was by herself when we weren't doing the breeding project. And I tried to grab her and she said no. And I just kept trying to, cause I had people over and I wanted to show her off and she bit me. 
And anyway, it was my fault. It was completely my fault. But again, it didn't hurt, didn't even leave a mark, did not break skin. They're very unlikely to bite you. Keep in mind they do jump. I have lots of footage of them jumping onto a camera, jumping onto my face as you just saw. So make sure they have a place to land. <laughs> if you put them on say a microphone stand so that you can take B-roll, always make sure that there's a place for them to land. And if you're, if they're walking on your hands, just keep in mind they might jump. So just be careful. They're very resilient, they're very robust, but that doesn't mean that you should just be all willy nilly with them off the ground. I mean, handle them on the floor if it makes you feel better. Of course, they don't have eyelids so they can lick their own eyes. Most geckos don't, by the way. This is another distinction between leopard geckos and crested geckos. Leopard geckos have eyelids that work. Crested geckos and most geckos do not. So they can lick their own eyes. It's really cute. I love to see it. And of course their feet, by the way, they feel kind of prickly because they have these, this mechanism where they can kind of climb glass, but also they have a little tiny nail or claw on the end of them, but they're definitely not gonna scratch you up. It's not gonna hurt you. It just feels a little bit weird. Lastly, price, availability, and morph. Can you even afford one? This is really important. The answer is yes. If you want something like chicken, so I don't actually know the genetics behind chicken. She was not a rescue, but someone was just giving her away. They watched the channel. They wanted me to have her, which is great. I'm only selling the babies either as normals or if they pop out with the gene from the male. So what I'm trying to say here is she was free. The other geckos that I have were $30 each. I bought them in 2016, but either way, you can buy them really inexpensively. Like 50 bucks is pretty standard for a normal but it's almost difficult to find normals nowadays because most people breed for genetics. So these really cool like Harlequins and Dalmatians and Lily Whites, and the market is really crazy. They used to be close to $1,000. Now they're not even close. The market really crashed. So the market really fluctuates with Cresta Geckos. I breed them because I think it's interesting and I wanna be able to give my audience the opportunity to buy Cresta Geckos from me. But that's the reason that I'm breeding, you know, two females instead of a bunch. I think that the market is really flooded right now. There's a ton of them. They're really easy to find. They're really inexpensive, especially for a lot of beginner morphs or easy morphs to come by. And then of course there are, you know, animals that are much more expensive. There's some really rare ones. There's animals that show up completely white and they don't know how to reproduce those. Dalmatians usually are a couple hundred bucks. So it just depends what you want, but no, they're not unaffordable. They're not difficult to find. And there's a ton of morphs for you to choose from. Eyelash geckos, they're sometimes called because of these cute little eyelashes on their face. That's why they're called crested geckos also. I love them, I think they're amazing. Maybe the easiest pet lizard in the world to care for. I'm so lucky to have one. I hope that you guys, if you do get one, you do your research more than just this video and you give them the best possible life. And of course, if you wanna DM me your enclosures to show them off to me, if you use this video as inspiration, I'd love to hear from you. Please subscribe to me on Instagram. Thanks so much for hitting the like and subscribe button here on YouTube. It really makes a huge difference to Chicken and I. And of course, a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get videos early, you guys get extra stuff, you guys get discounts on merch, one-on-ones, all that, and more for as little as $1 a month. That's it, because I do videos on Mondays and Thursdays. That means I'll see you in the next one.